I'm Dr. Douglas McKenzie. I'm a plastic surgeon in Santa Barbara, and I'm putting together this series of videos on breast implant illness. It's a, it's a controversial topic. It's a growing topic. Um, I treat a lot of people with this uh, issue, and uh, I just feel that there's a lot of misinformation out there, and there's a lot of miscommunication between patients and uh, surgeons. Uh, other physicians, their primary care physicians, for example, there's miscommunication between professional societies, regulatory bodies, and patients as well. So uh, I, I hope to clear up some misconceptions and just kind of give you a, a general overview of breast implant illness. Uh, if you've if you found this video in this series of videos, you probably already know quite a bit about breast implant illness, and maybe you've, you're a patient who has implants and you're concerned about, concerned about it. Uh, so what is breast implant illness? Well, breast implant illness, uh, we'll get to the controversial issues at a later stage, but what is it? It's, it's a constellation of symptoms in someone who's had breast implant illness or breast implants rather, uh, either for cosmetic or reconstructive purposes. And these symptoms um, are varied. There are many different kinds of symptoms, but the common ones tend to be fatigue, uh, insomnia, tiredness, headaches, aches and pains, uh, ringing in the ears, blurry vision, uh, brain fog, uh, and there can be other uh, issues as well, such as uh, skin rashes, uh, cystitis, uh, bladder problems, in other words. So, and that just touches the surface. Uh, you, you, you can go on some of the uh, breast implant illness websites and, and support group pages and, and find many more. Um, it kind of creates a problem though, because so many of these symptoms um, are, are subjective and there are not good ways of evaluating them or measuring them. So if you take, for example, um, you know, uh, pain, uh, how, how do you measure pain? Well, someone can say that they have pain, uh, you know, uh, as a five on a scale of one to 10, but what does that really mean? Pain is so subjective from one person to another. So these are, these are hard things to pin down. And when you consider uh, fatigue, Many of my patients are in their 30s and 40s and perhaps have small children in the household. Well, anybody is going to have fatigue uh, in that situation, in breast implants or not, right? So it's hard to sort out what of these symptoms are attributable perhaps to the breast implants and, and, and which ones are not. Um, as far as named diseases or rheumatological conditions, um, Breast implant illness is, is not really that, although pa patients with those um, do tend to improve when the, uh, the implants and the capsules are removed. Um, I wouldn't say that breast implant removal and capsulectomy is curative in those situations. They typically still have their, their named diseases, but uh, the patients who really have dramatic improvements are these, these other folks who have many s different kinds of symptoms that, that get better uh, when the implants and the capsules come out. So that begs the question, well, is it a real thing? Uh, did they get better because the implants and the capsules came out? Or was it a placebo effect or, or more properly a, a nocebo effect? And we'll get into that later on as well. So that's kind of where the controversy lies. Many people, many surgeons, plastic surgeons, many physicians don't even think it's a real thing and they attribute the success uh, that patients have, uh, in other words, their improvement afterwards, to that kind of an effect, more of a psychological effect. Um, so you might be wondering, what do I believe? Do I believe it's a real thing or not? I do believe it's a real thing. I, I believe it's a, in a cohort of people uh, that aren't easily measured, even by the studies that we've, that we've done, the studies back in the 90s, that there's a small cohort of people that are going to have adverse effects uh, from the breast implants and they're not going to be easily identified, certainly not ahead of time. Um, so I think these people have been neglected. 
and that's what we're seeing. I, I tend to see a lot of breast implant illness patients, um, but I, I do believe that uh, it is a real uh, issue in some people. We certainly need to do more research on it. There's, there's some efforts in that regard, which I applaud, uh, but probably not enough. Um, how do we define, how do, how do I identify someone prior to breast surgery that might be susceptible? Well, there, there are no good solid uh, ways to do that. I think uh, some things could lead us in that direction. Uh, when I do a consultation with a breast implant, uh, with a potential breast implant patient, I ask her what her family history is of autoimmune problems. And if she tells me that she uh, has a mother and a sister and a uncle and uh, with, with autoimmune conditions, um, I, I might steer her away from breast augmentation or at least tell her to be very uh, aware of, of how her health is afterwards. And I'm not just talking about the first weeks or months, but years down the road. So just to keep it in mind is a possibility. Uh, genetic testing, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, there's some uh, talk uh, about whether certain uh, genetic polymorphisms, such as the MTHFR genes, um, might make someone susceptible, possibly. I, I just don't think the, the research is there. But I certainly wouldn't discount that. Everyone's different. Everyone has a different genetic makeup. And there could be patterns with um, certain constellation of genes that perhaps uh, make someone susceptible. We just don't know. It hasn't been done yet, so it can't be ruled out. Uh, Anyway, we'll be talking about breast implant illness um, treatments, the surgical treatments, um, some more about the controversy. Uh, we'll talk about what can be done afterwards um, to enhance the cosmetic result in someone who's getting their implants removed. And um, so welcome to this. I hope it's helpful.